Today, at 6.29 a.m. in Israel, air raid sirens marked one year since the October 7th attacks by Hamas. Outside of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's house in Jerusalem, the sirens played while demonstrators held signs of loved ones still being held hostage in Gaza. Almost at the same time, Israelis along the Gaza Strip also heard sirens, but they were not part of a protest. They were real, as Hamas launched rockets toward Israel, which Israeli forces said they mostly intercepted. It was a split-screen moment capturing life in Israel right now, still under threat, even as people in the country remember the attacks that upended their lives. That's the case for people like Shimon Buskila. He lost his son on October 7th during one of Hamas's attacks at a music festival near the Gaza border. We don't know. It seems to be like yesterday was the last day we saw him. For us, yesterday was the last day of the old life. Before we start one year in the new life. It was the worst terrorist attack in Israel's history. 1,200 people were killed, and dozens of hostages are still being held by Hamas. In Gaza, the war there has left more than 41,000 people dead, according to the Gaza Health Ministry. Now, Israel is at war, not just against Hamas, but multiple enemies. When Hamas attacked the communities along the Gaza border. Israel retaliated with what has proven to be a ferocious year-long war in Gaza, now expanded into Lebanon. It's fighting against Houthi rebels in Yemen and has even exchanged missiles with Iran. Steve Hendricks is the Jerusalem bureau chief for The Post. He has been reporting on October 7th and its aftermath in Israel. It's still a country very much in trauma. There's tremendous um, division in the country. There's anger. There's despair. And and all of that um, has resurfaced to some degree today. There's just an overriding sense of disquiet and uncertainty in a country that just doesn't know how this is going to end. The hope of a lasting peace with the Palestinians, an end of the decades-long conflict have largely evaporated as even left-leaning and progressive Israelis uh, now express great doubt about finding common ground with their Palestinian neighbors. Palestinians in both the West Bank and those who live in Israel are in the same situation. It feels to a lot of Israelis like the country is in an existential crisis. From the newsroom of The Washington Post, this is Post Reports. I'm Martine Powers. It's Monday, October 7th. Today, I talked to Steve about the internal divisions within Israel as its war in the Middle East expands. So, Steve, you said that the war in Gaza, which was sparked by the October 7th attacks, that it's one of the longest conflicts in Israel's history— Why has this war gone on for so long? There's a lot of reasons. Um, For one, Israel has not achieved what what Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says is its chief goal, which is, uh, quote, destroying Hamas. A a lot of analysts, including some of Netanyahu's own people, say that destroying Hamas is not a realistic goal. It's a movement and an ideology as much as a military organization. There are political reasons why uh, the prime minister has been uh, resistant to reaching a ceasefire with Hamas. Um, It allows Netanyahu to avoid what is expected to be a pretty severe political accounting of what allowed October 7th to happen in the first place. Uh, The the head of Hamas, uh, Yawa Sinwar, who is still believed to be alive and hiding in one of the tunnels, also has expressed no interest in concluding this. Um, His movement is badly damaged, but in some ways triumphant. They've created the chaos in the region that they wanted to. Um, He remains at large. In spite of pressure from the United States, great pressure, and from Europe and from Israeli allies, none of it's been 
enough to overcome the other dynamics that that keep this conflict going. And what about the current state of Hamas as an organization? What is the strength of Hamas now, and how has that changed over the past year? After a year of this intense war in Gaza, Hamas is very much degraded as a military organization. We hear that from analysts in Israel, in the United States. They've lost a majority of their fighters, much of their arsenal, and access to this network of tunnels that is central to their ability to, to wage war inside of Gaza. But the, the organization is, is not gone. Its leader is still alive, presumably. It has um, cells in the West Bank that are very active. And frankly, it's in a, in a recruiting boom. We're told that, that the conditions in Gaza are creating many, many, many volunteers. It's able to recruit fighters. They're, they are not well-trained. They are not likely to become an effective force anytime soon. Israel is not likely to take its eye off of, off of Gaza or to allow, uh, for example, uh, materials and weapons to be smuggled in from, from Egypt, as has been the case. But Ham- Hamas is badly damaged, but uh, not gone. And I want to talk specifically about the prospect of a ceasefire deal. It seems like over the past year, every few weeks you would hear, well, you know, the deal might be getting closer or maybe there's progress. Um, At certain points, the Biden administration was involved trying to present a framework for a ceasefire. And then every time it's fallen apart and it seems like nothing has really happened. Why have all these attempts to implement a ceasefire failed? Well, the hopes have climbed and been dashed just over and over again. And, uh, you know, American officials have occasionally been very bullish. We're, we're close. This time it's going to work. And that's been heartbreaking for the families of hostages, for the Gazan civilians who are all in misery. But when you talk to Israeli officials and administration officials in private, in their most candid moments, even they say it's never really been that close. The, these dynamics mm. that are keeping the sides so far apart show no signs of, of resolution. And I think that's unfortunately as true or more true right now than it has been uh, in the last year. There really is very, very little evidence that anything meaningful in the terms of a breakthrough is even being discussed at high levels at this moment. The war is expanding. It's not nearing a resolution of any kind. And Steve, you said that your sense is that people in Israel right now are pretty divided and that this is no longer a time of unity for the Israeli people, but um, a a time of real tensions about what their country is doing, how they've, um, uh, how Israel has handled the last year. Can you Talk to me a little bit more about those divisions and how you see them playing out. Well, it's, it's actually a very dynamic time. There are huge divisions. There's a lot of anger. The country is a split. I'm not quite sure where that line would be drawn, but it's divided between those who want to keep fighting until Hamas is, um, quote-unquote, eliminated, and those who are desperate for any kind of ceasefire that would result in the hundred or so Israelis who remain in captivity coming home. But but that has not a, been a, a static uh, equilibrium. I would say that in recent weeks, as Israel has made a, a tremendous um, offensive push against Hezbollah in Lebanon and against Iran, uh, th- there's been a little more unity. That that's a mm. uh, that's a fight that kind of draws almost all Israelis together. There's there's even on on the left. There's a recognition of of Hezbollah as a very dangerous enemy and of Iran as as an existential threat. And you, we've seen uh, great majorities of Israelis applauding the Israeli army's progress in the last few weeks. And likewise, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's political fortunes have have improved a bit. So there is some sense that um, after a very bleak year of Israel really losing its confidence in its military and intelligence, they're on they're on the move again. They they have seized the initiative, at least up up north. 
In Gaza, I think there's very much a sense of being stuck in a quagmire. The fate of the remaining Israeli hostages is really top of mind, I would say, for a majority of citizens here. There are those who, uh, with sort of a hard eye, say, well, those, those citizens are lost to us, and uh, a ceasefire would equal surrender against Hamas, so we keep fighting in, in spite of their still being Israelis in Hamas hands. But I think most Israelis feel like uh, priority number one is getting those citizens back home. Uh, unfortunately, many of whom are known to be dead, but the, the bodies are considered uh, a sacred obligation. So Steve, I understand that you spoke to a woman named Shawnee Miles Itach, who was in a kibbutz that was attacked by Hamas on October 7th. I would I would love to hear a little bit about how she views this moment and what she said to you about what she felt Israel should do going forward. We met her in kibbutz Barry a few weeks ago. We talked to her on the front porch of her house just a few yards from the home where her father was shot and then burned to death. This is what people have to understand. This is terrorist who kidnapped people from my house. My best friends were murdered. My children's best friends were murdered. She's describing her frustration and her disbelief that Israel can negotiate with Hamas at all right now. Sorry for the expression. No. What the you know, I mean, what people think? This is not an army. We do not need to talk to them. We do not need to negotiate with them. We need to destroy them. For the sake of the whole world, we are fighting now, okay? We are fighting for everyone. Her story and the story of Kibbutz Berry, I think really illustrates the, the changes in Israel and Israeli society in the last year. Uh, Berry, which was one of the deadliest places on October 7th, a little bit more than 10% of their entire population were, were killed or kidnapped, was actually a haven of peaceniks for decades. It's one of the more well-known places where activists worked for a lasting accord with the Palestinians. They had a program where their retirees picked up Gazans at the crossing and drove them to hospitals around Israel. A lot of Gazans were employed in Barry and in the surrounding fields. The The woman we just heard from talked about how Gazans were at her bat mitzvah when she was young. She has lifelong friends. She still sends money to families in Gaza. But her sense of peace is shattered, like many of her countrymen. She sees no possibility, at least in the near future, for an accord. She's astonished that the world is blaming Israel for the intensity of the war in Gaza, when all she thinks about, frankly, is the fact that they came into her community, killed her father, her daughter's two best friends, um, and acts of a atrocity and brutality that, that she'll never forget. She's a different person than she was on the morning of October 7th, as is her country in many ways. After the break, how the past year has changed Israel's relationship with the rest of the world. We'll be right back. So, Steve, you've been telling me about the view from inside Israel as we hit the one-year anniversary of the October 7th attacks. But I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the view from outside of Israel and from the rest of the world. How has Israel's um, standing in the world changed over the last year? Well, it's in danger of becoming a pariah state in many parts of the world. Um, it. it it perhaps most complicated is its vital relationship with the United States. Uh, President Joe Biden and his administration have, have proven to be largely ineffective in steering Netanyahu's conduct of this war. 
I think uh, Biden showed his frustration last week speaking to reporters. He seemed to be talking almost directly to Netanyahu saying, remember, there, Israel has not had a stronger supporter than this administration. No administration has helped Israel more than I have. None. 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 And I think uh, Bibi should remember that. From the very beginning, they have, they have pressured Israel to, to change the way they... They fight in Gaza to do more to protect civilians, to allow more humanitarian aid in. Administration officials will acknowledge privately that they just have not found a way to influence this conflict as much as they would like to. Having said that, the material support of the United States has not significantly changed. The rhetoric seems a little different from um, the vice president, Kamala Harris than from Biden himself, but the the policy projections really don't amount to, to much of a difference. In the rest of the world, Israel is, is suffering an even bigger blow to its reputation and to the regard that countries seem to have for it. You know, um, Netanyahu and the defense minister here are, are now under indictment from the International Criminal Court. Uh, the other international courts have have uh, declared its operations in Gaza to be illegal. Um, it's a remarkable moment in which Israel finds itself at odds with the international community in ways that it, it really hasn't experienced in, in decades. And yet, uh, none of that seems to deter Israel's uh, actions, which the government and and um, many citizens here view to be completely justified and absolutely necessary to keep from being eliminated from this mm. part of the world where they are surrounded by very hostile and heavily armed enemies. What is your sense of how much the Israeli government and the Israeli people care about this prospect, as you described it, of of them becoming kind of international pariahs. As you said, that hasn't been enough to to really change their course of action when it comes to how they're conducting um, this war. But when you talk to Israelis, are they concerned about what it means to have uh, other countries around the world looking at their actions with a lot of um, disapproval and in some cases, like, horror? In some cases, certainly. I mean, there are a lot of uh, Americans who have immigrated here, a lot of Europeans, a lot of people with family in different parts of the world. Um, they certainly pay a lot of attention to what, in particular, the United States has to say about Israel. But I also think, largely, no. <laughs> it's not a very important topic. It's hard to overstate how central the hostages remain in this society. That is what people talk about in almost every conversation. And further, there just isn't a lot of media coverage of that issue. The, the, the media here is largely, largely dominated by coverage of, of the wars, plural now, from an Israeli point of view, the, the impact on troops that are killed and their families, and again, the, the hostage situation. There, there is almost no coverage of the, the toll that this fighting has taken on civilians in Gaza. Um, there's not much discussion of the more than a million Lebanese civilians who are now displaced from their homes. Israelis have a very Israel-centric view of what's going on here. So, Steve, you talked about how there is now this new front in the war, and that is Israel's conflict with Lebanon. And this is not entirely new. I mean, over the past year, Israel and Lebanon have been um, trading attacks with each other. Uh, Hezbollah, we know, is aligned with Hamas, and that's why it is an enemy of Israel. But, but why is it now, at this moment, that Israel is choosing to ramp up its conflict with Lebanon, to invade Lebanon, even while there's still this military campaign going on in Gaza? I think they felt largely pushed into this because of the number upwards of, of 60,000 uh, Israeli civilians who have been evacuated from 
communities near the Lebanese border for a year now. Uh, there's huge domestic pressure uh, for those people to be allowed to go home. They've just missed the start of a second school year on September 1st. Um, that has, in recent months, become a, an issue that's probably second to the hostage release as most important to the broader population here. And we now know that Israel had the intelligence and even uh, a hidden sabotage system in Hezbollah pagers that exploded uh, about two weeks ago that, that probably let them know that this was a moment that they could make great strides. Uh, they've been able to make progress on the ground, clearing weapons stashes. They're not close to beating Hezbollah um, in declaring victory, but they made a calculation that they could do a lot of damage to it, and so far they've been proven correct. Is there any fear about what it means for Israel, especially with this new phase of, of the war in Lebanon, to essentially be going it alone? You know, in one way, yes, there is. They certainly recognize their dependence on particularly the United States and its weapons. They get weapons from the UK and from, from many other places. But there's also a strong sense that uh, here that I think is very, very embedded in the culture that if necessary, they will go it alone and they will not be deterred from what they consider their strategic priorities, even if it means fracturing some of their most important relationships. I think that dates back to what I would almost call an ancient sense of uh, the need to be self-sufficient on the part of, of, of Jews who have suffered pogroms and Holocaust uh, for thousands of years. So I think one thing on a lot of people's minds right now is the question of escalation, right? You have Israel attacking Lebanon and Hezbollah, and then you have Iran attacking Israel in response to that. And now it seems like the question is, does this spin out to Israel attacking Iran? And if that did happen, what would that mean? What, what do you see as a prospect of that? And why is that a big question that, that we're all wondering about? Yeah, Israel and Iran are in the middle of, a, of an unprecedented and very dangerous back and forth um, during the course of the year Israel managed to kill some senior Iranian uh, commanders in Syria. In April, Iran launched uh, about 300 cruise missiles and drones and some ballistic missiles at Israeli territory, uh, almost all of which were successfully shot down. Israel then killed uh, Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh in the middle of Tehran in a remarkable airstrike something they haven't publicly acknowledged, but is universally recognized. Um, and then we saw in September an airstrike that killed the leader and founder of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah. So this is getting more and more dangerous. Uh, last week, Iran launched a, a second uh, very serious barrage, almost 200 ballistic missiles. Um, they did strike a couple of Israeli Air bases. The only fatality was uh, a, actually a man from Gaza who was sheltering in Jericho in the West Bank at the time. But everyone expects Israel to respond to that attack. We know the uh, administration in Washington is pressing them to be to be very measured and calibrated. But it's just really gotten to the edge of um, uh, the the potential for you know the the often uh, cited regional war seems seems higher than ever at this moment. And I think leaders and civilians, frankly, in both countries are on pins and needles. So then what does the possible end look like here? And I know you said that's a question that many Israelis are asking themselves right now. I'm sure people in Gaza and Lebanon are thinking that too, as, as well as us here in the U.S. But what are the possibilities for how this could conclude? And is there any hope that we could see an end to this conflict on the sooner side? You know, I've, I've never covered a, a conflict or a war where at least some shards of hope didn't coexist alongside of despair. And that's the case here as well. 
no one here has very much optimism for things ending on the sooner side, as you say. But it's a very dynamic situation. Um, diplomatic efforts never stop completely. Um, Israel is feeling a little more confident because of its successes against Hezbollah. And, you know, that could create a change in the dynamic. That could create conditions in which Israel is more willing to feel like they can reach a deal in the north or even in Gaza. Um, they are continuing their operations in Gaza. They've, they've exposed and penetrated a truly remarkable network of tunnels. And one of those is the Hamas leader, Sinwar, if they were to capture him, it would allow Netanyahu to say, we really have destroyed this organization. Things are going to keep happening, and there is going to come a moment when uh, a, a country that doesn't want to be at war and its enemies, who are also exhausted, are going to make some kind of change. I wouldn't begin to predict when that would be, but I will dare say it is going to happen at some point. Steve, thank you so much for explaining all this. Thank you, Martin. Steve Hendricks is the Jerusalem bureau chief for The Post. In recent days, we've also seen events here in the U.S. commemorating the one-year anniversary of October 7th. There are vigils taking place in Central Park in New York, on the grounds of the Washington Monument in D.C. And last Friday, a group gathered near the Capitol, part of a weekly event to bring attention to the hostages. One of those people was a woman named Julie Powell. She talked about how the October 7th attacks changed her relationship to her faith. My Jewish identity has changed since October 7th in that I took for granted that Israel would always be a safe and secure place. I now understand I have to do everything I can to make sure Israel is a safe and secure place, whether that mean voting, whether that mean me getting involved in the Jewish-Israeli community in America um, by being here every Friday by connecting to the Israeli Jewish community in any which way I can. Students across the country are also marking the anniversary on college campuses. Some have launched pro-Palestinian Week of Rage protests. Others are hosting remembrances of Israelis who were killed or taken hostage. I also want to mention a new investigation from The Post about something you heard Steve mention in our conversation, those shocking pager attacks in Lebanon. Our colleagues have uncovered new details about the plan that Israel used to sabotage those communication devices. They learned about the sales pitch that was made to Hezbollah, convincing them to buy bigger pagers with larger batteries. They learned about how the pagers were designed to inflict maximum damage to the people holding them. And they also learned about why this whole strategy was controversial for Israeli security forces. It's a fascinating read, reporting you'll only find from the Post, and you're definitely going to want to check out the whole story. You can find a link in today's show notes and at postreports.com. That's it for Post Reports. Thanks for listening. If you're looking for the latest updates on the big news of the day, check out our morning news briefing, The Seven. We bring you through the seven stories that you need to know about every weekday morning by 7 a.m. You can listen to it wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's show was produced by Peter Bresnan with help from Renny Spranovsky and Emma Talkoff. It was mixed by Sean Carter and edited by Monica Campbell with help from Rena Flores. Thanks to Jesse messner hage Heidi Levine, Joe Snell, and Elisa Shadiev Kaff. I'm Martine Powers. We'll be back tomorrow with more stories from The Washington Post. 